All righty, welcome back to 353. So today we get to talk about the last topic, persistence and specifically disks. So let's do an age check. How many of you know I've ever seen one? Few, yeah, like the, what the original iPod had that was like a big hunk of metal and your parents tell you to not like bring a magnet near a computer. So those are pretty old. It's like a spinning magnetic disc. Takes a long time. Most of you do not have that, but if you were to have that, well, it's a spinning hunk of metal and basically there's a magnetic head that reads and writes bits and well, it's kind of divided up into pages and if we were to talk about that, you have to like schedule accesses to it because sequential access, because it's an actual spinning thing, relatively fast, but random access, like it has to move a magnetic head, and wait for the disc to spin around and it's a whole mess and you can schedule it and all that. We will skip talking about that because uh, that is old. So instead we will talk about solid state drives, which most of us actually have. So instead of magnetic discs, like RAM, except that they persist whether or not they have power. So pros is they don't have any moving parts. There's no spinning magnetic disks that if you drop it, uh, it probably breaks or any physical limitations like waiting for a hunk of metal to spin around has higher throughput. And because, well, it's just circuitry, it has good random access more energy efficient, don't have to put energy to spin a hunk of metal, and better space density, so, you know, SSDs can be like that little thing, while a hard drive is typically something like this by like that, so it's a lot more space efficient, but more expensive if you like, I don't know, data hoarding, uh, like a local Netflix or something like that. Um, they have lower endurance, so you can only write to SSDs a certain amount of times before it just wears out and you're not allowed to write to it anymore. And they are more complicated to write drivers for in some aspect. And we will touch on that a little bit, but not go into too much detail. So how an SSD is actually organized, it's organized into several tiers. So there is a die, so that is the complete circuit that stores all the information then it is divided into bigger things called planes. Don't really have to know about that. And then on each planes, there are a block. So that is one thing we argue a little bit about. And then on a block, there are pages, which may or may not be the same size as pages in virtual memory. So some weird numbers, they're much faster than hard disk drives, the pages typically are the same as with our virtual memory subsystem. So most of the time they're four kilobytes, but they have these weird properties. So reading a page from an SSD, typically pretty fast, like 10 microseconds. Writing a page is like 10 times slower. So it's gonna be like 100 microseconds. And then this is weird, erasing a block. So the weird rule is you cannot erase a single page at a time you must erase an entire block. And here, well, a block contains many pages, could be eight, could be 16, 32, something like that. But we can only erase blocks at a time and not pages at a time. And erasing a block is way slower. It's like one millisecond. So because if you're the operating system, you have to actually use these rules in case you want to go ahead and erase data or something like that. So the rules are you can only read complete pages and write to freshly erased pages. So you can't just write a page and then write over it again. You have to erase it before you're allowed to write to it again. So erasing, like I said, is done per block. So block could also have 128 pages, 256, something like that. And with that rule, well, that entire block needs to be erased before actually writing something. And this is why writes can be really, really, really slow on top of being just a bit slower by default. So we might need to create a new block. So if we want to just overwrite 
one block, or sorry, one page, well, what we might have to do is move, let's say there's 128, we would have to move 127 of these blocks to a new page, or sorry, to a new block, then also make the modification there, and then we would have to go ahead and erase that whole block of everything we moved. So we might just have to move a lot of thing, j things just so we can erase blocks at a time. So the operating system can help speed up SSDs. So the SSDs might need to garbage collect blocks. So they might want to go ahead, you know, move any pages that are still alive to a new block that it could do while it has, while it's idle because, well, that would otherwise just waste time. So there's also a few other things. So the disk controller itself, if you go ahead and delete a file and you don't use some pages anymore, well, the SSD is not going to know that you no longer use them. It would just assume that they are still alive. So just like with memory allocation, you have to go ahead, tell the disk controller that, oh, okay, I'm not actually using this page anymore. So if you want, you can go ahead and just erase it in the background or just stop using it or, you know, what, whatever. Just it's marked as unused for now. So the OS can do something called a trim command and that informs an SSD that like a whole block is unused and then instead of just waiting for a block to get erased whenever you really need it, so it like comes down to the last minute, then the SSD just when it's idle, you can just say, okay, I'm not using any pages on the block, just erase it whenever you're idle and not doing anything else important. Uh, and then it can go ahead, erase it, and then we don't have any penalty there because it's doing it while it's idle. Yep. So, like, if I just remove a file or something like that, well, my OS might just keep track of, like, okay, I'm not using it anymore, so I don't have to tell the disk anything, right? I just keep track of it in memory and I'd be like, okay, I'm not using it anymore. That's fine. So the, the hardware won't know anything about that. So that's why you have to actually tell it that, hey, I'm not actually using this page anymore, so you can go ahead, you can get rid of it whenever you want. And, yeah, SSD is just storage. Um, the only difference between memory is that this is persistent and it's slower. So when you go ahead and turn off your computer and reboot it again, your information's still there, unlike RAM where your information is not, no longer there. But a lot slower than RAM, um, but it has like the same ideas where it divides things up into pages. So any quick questions about that? So it's just kind of this weird thing where we have to erase in blocks and we have other rules where we can only write to freshly erase. And it's kind of weird, gets tricky if you actually have to implement something like that. Okay, so we can fun talk about the fun topic then. So, so far we've been talking about like single devices in most of your computers unless you are well, not slightly insane, but more like me, you probably just have one disk in your computer. So sometimes people that actually care about data integrity jokingly call it a single large expensive disk because it's just one large disk for all your data. And what happens if the hard drive in your laptop dies? Are you screwed? Absolutely. <laughs> so that's why it's important to have backups of your files and all that or not a backup, but you can try and ensure data integrity using something called RAID, which is short for a redundant array of independent disks. So you have more than one disk in your system, and then you configure it so that all those disks work together to distribute the data. Maybe AKA you have multiple copies of the data so that you don't have data loss if a single device dies or maybe you use redundancy in order to increase throughput. So if you have two drives, maybe you want to have your disk performance be twice as fast. So the first RAID, they all have numbers associated with them. So the first one is just called RAID 0 because we're in computing, everything is zero indexed, and it is called a striped volume. So 
What it does is basically just distributes all of your data. Instead of being on one disk, it distributes it all across two disks. So it will divide up your data in like little stripes or chunks of like 128 kilobytes or 256 kilobytes. And for just for sake of argument, say you have a large file called A that's split up into eight parts. Well, if you have two disks here, so like disk zero and disk one, maybe you put the odd parts of that file on disk zero, and maybe you put the even parts of that on disk one. And why would you do this? Well, if these two disks have like the same performance compared to a single disk, if I'm trying to read information, well, I can read that same file twice as fast. So if it was a single drive, I would have to read eight chunks of data all from the same disk. While if I do this and I have two disks, four from one and four from the other, and assuming I can do that in parallel because I should be able to, well, reading would be twice as fast. So I would get two times the performance here and this would scale up. So if I had three disks, then I would have three times the performance, four, I would have four times the performance. So this is a common thing you'll see in like people with really high performance PCs. They'll put two drives in it and do a RAID zero so that it essentially goes twice as fast. And it's the same idea of thing. The right performance will increase in this case by two times because instead of writing all eight chunks to the same disks, assuming I can do it in parallel, I can read or write four to one and four to the other, and it would be twice as fast as well. So I would get, in this case, two times the read performance and two times the write performance compared to a single disk. But what is the very, very bad drawback of doing this? If I had just had a single point of failure when I had one disk before, how many points of failure do I have now until I lose data? Yeah. No, so if I lose one of the disks here, I lose essentially like half of a file, like half of every single file I have, and now they're all useless. <laughs> so you can't really do much if you have like, you can't really boot your computer if you have half of Windows. <laughs> It's just not going to work. And it's just gonna be a random half of Windows. So now the big drawback here is that, well, before when I had a single point of failure until I had data loss, now if one of my two drives fails, then I have data loss. So you would only do this if you only care about performance and you do not care about your data pretty much at all because it's actually worse if you care about your data. So this, for performance only, the data is striped or just divided across all disks in the array. We can have more than two, we could have three, we could have four. Typically people just stop at two because well, you get two times the performance and if one disk drive dies then whatever. You just buy a new one and just replace all of your data because hopefully it's fast. So you have faster parallel access, roughly n times speed up, but if any disk fails, you have data loss, so we have more points of failure. And another pro that's not listed here is if these two disks were, I don't know, what's a good size? Two terabytes? So if these two disks were two terabytes each, then you could use up to four terabytes because it's just two times two. So we could use up to four terabytes in this case. All right, any questions about RAID zero? Room, room, go fast. So if you want to go fast, you can buy another hard drive. Yep. How does it actually make it faster? Because now you're dividing everything by two and then have to retrieve things from two different disks and like match them together. Yeah, but I'd be like reading data from the two disks in parallel. Yeah, yeah, so assuming you do it in parallel. If I could only do one at a time, then we wouldn't see any benefit whatsoever but we assume we can do it in parallel. And there might be a bit of overhead with that, but typically they read into memory. Memory's a lot faster than disks, so it's mostly about two times. All right, so RAID zero, performance only. There is 
a flip side where we actually just care about our data and we don't care about performance as much. So there is RAID 1, and that is a complete mirror. Oop. Uh, Okay, hopefully that question got answered on Discord. I think so, that we have multiple points of failure. If you lose half your files, you're still screwed. So, RAID 1, that is called a mirror, and that makes essentially every single disk an exact copy of each other. So, if I have, say, file A now only has four parts, well, I would store com the complete file A on disk 0, and also disk one would be a complete copy of disk zero, so it would have the full contents of file A as well. So, if I have RAID zero where my two disks are exactly the same, would I get any benefits in terms of read performance for this? Everyone's saying no? Why not, why not? Yeah. Yeah, you would still have better read performance, right? So just because it stores the whole file doesn't mean I can't have the same idea as before. I could read you know, the odd parts of that file from disk zero and the even parts from disk one. So I would get two times my read performance. But in the case of writes, well, writes aren't gonna, writes aren't gonna go faster, right? If I need to update this file, well, I have to update it on every single drive. Assuming I can do it in parallel, it's the same as just writing to a single drive because it all needs the same file. So I can actually get better read performance out of this just because I can read half from one drive and half from the other. But since they are exact copies of each other, if I'm updating information, I have to update it to every drive so my write performance is the same. Now, assuming each of these disks were two terabytes each, how many terabytes can I use to store my files? Two, right? Just two. They're just copies of each other. I can't use four because, well, then that would mean uh, I have the files spread out over each and they aren't exact copies of each other. So since they're exact copies of each other, I can only use two terabytes. Even if I throw another disk on here and make it a clone of all the other ones, well, I can still only use two terabytes. So it's simple but wasteful. So every disk in the array looks exactly the same as one another. It has good reliability. So as long as we have a single disk still alive, we don't have any data loss. So if this disk just dies, like it fails, you throw it out, you throw it in the garbage, you step on it, whatever. Doesn't matter, you still have a copy of your data on disk zero. So, and if I have three drives that are all copies of each other, well, two of them can die. I still have a single copy left, so I'm good. So, this kind of the extreme for caring about our data. As long as one disk is left standing, we, don't, we haven't lost any data. We can get good read performance. But it's a fairly high cost for redundancy. You just have n copies, where n is the number of disks you have. And the write performance is the same as a single disk, so we can do a lot better than this. So this is typically only used if you only have two disks, because we're essentially just wasting half of our space, which isn't too bad. So the next is RAID 4, and you might ask what the hell happened to RAID 2 and 3. Um, they were bad ideas, so no one uses them anymore. <laughs> so, and also, guess what? No one uses RAID 4 either. RAID 4 is a bad idea, but it will illustrate what the idea is for the next level of RAID. So, it introduces something called parity, and parity is just some amount of information that we can use to reconstruct some lost information. So data stripes, it's the same idea as like RAID 0 where we just stripe our data so we divide it into little blocks and distribute. But now we have a dedicated parity disk. So if we have four disks, in this case, we have, we stripe our data across three of them 
and then we use one disk, the last disk here, with parity information so that if any one of the disk drives, we can use the information on disk three to reconstruct that data that was lost. Read and write performance, well, the other three disks look a lot like RAID zero, so we should get like three times the read performance and three times the write performance, about-ish. Um, and we're also going to have to update this parity information so that we can reconstruct data if it gets lost. And this parity information is typically an XOR of all of the bits or bytes, whatever, across all the other disks. So how many of us are familiar with XOR? Should be everyone, right? All right, someone want to explain to me in plain English what it means to XOR three things together? Yeah? Yeah, you're gonna say the same thing too? Yeah, odd or even number of ones. So easy way to think of it is if I XOR everything together, it'll essentially tell me zero if the result of adding them all together is even and one if the result of adding them all together is odd. So with that, let's just do a quick example. So let's say I had like an A1, an A2, and an A3 all across different disks, and let's say I had a one, one, or zero, one, one, and then my parity information is just gonna be when I XOR all these together. So if I XOR all these together, I'll just show them for individual bits, but you can expand it to bytes if you want. So one plus one plus zero, well, that's two, which means that our parity would be a zero. So using this parity information, we can go ahead and if one of these disks dies, so if I just, you know, this disk is now dead and I go ahead and erase it, well, because I know this parity information here, I can uniquely identify whether what I lost is a one or a zero. So it's basically telling me that if I add I need to find a number, whoops. So I need to find a missing number here that if I take a one and add it to it, so this will either be a zero or a one. So if I take a one and then I add something to it, it means that it needs to be in this case even. Well, because I took, I had that bit of information, which is saying that it needs to be even. Well, I know it can't be a one because if I do, or sorry, it has to be a one, sorry. Ooh. All right, so I know it has to be a one because one plus one is two and that is even. It can't be a zero because then if I did one plus zero, that would give me an odd number which would disagree with what I had before. And this is true for anything I would lose here. So if I went ahead and I lost this one, well, then I know that if I add two to a one or a zero, it needs to be, be a one because that would get three, that's an odd number. So the data I lost, it had to be a zero. So everyone okay with that? All right, so what if I lost two? Yeah, yeah. I don't know, right? I have two solutions. It could be this or it could be that, and they both agree, and I have no idea which is which. So in this case, I can tolerate a single disk dying. That's fine, I can reconstruct what information it has, but if two disks die, then I'm screwed, right? You might be able to pay someone a lot of money to recover that data because, well, this is like 50-50, they could essentially roll the dice and do the 50-50 a lot of times and like knowing the file format and everything, they could guess what bytes it had to be in order to make sense, but you're gonna have to pay someone like a few thousand dollars to do that for you. So yeah, um, you can only really tolerate one disk failure. So funny story, <laughs> you could, store some of your important data on something like this, like, I don't know, maybe your PhD thesis. And then maybe a disk, a disk dies while you are working on it. 
okay, that's fine, right? So I could still recover it. I just had to go to the store, buy another hard drive, stick it in and let it recalculate, that's fine. Well, it turns out with hard drives, they typically die together <laughs> because if you buy them at the same store at the same time, they manufactured the same, they have like the same level of wear on them, so they'll probably die close to each other. So I was busy and I left it for a week. And uh, while I was working, the other one died. Did I lose data? Yes. So do not do what I did. And if one disk drive dies, go to the store and buy another one. So if you're doing this, like data centers will do something like this and they will have some drives on hand already available so that when one dies, someone's job at like the Google Data Center or AWS or something is literally to go around with a cart of hard drives and just stick them in as they are dying and replace them. And that is why you use cloud providers to you know, take care of your data because they hired someone to literally just do that all day and make sure your data survives. So that is also a fun career path you could have. You could be the guy that has a cart and a bunch of hard drives and sticks them in when they die. So, does it pay well? Does it pay well? Uh, probably. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you probably have to like know all this stuff and know the theory for it, so you probably have to take a course like that to have that job. So, good thing we're taking this course, so we can get paid a lot to just shuck hard drives all day. <laughs> so, that's pretty good. Um, do, do, do. So, having this, kind of a bad idea though. So, what happens in this case, if we have to update, let's say we only have to update, I don't know, A1, well then we have to you know, read all the other disks, recalculate the parity information, then update this disk. Then if we write, let's say, B2 to this disk, oh, well, we also have to update the parity data on disk three, and oh no, if we update, I don't know, C3 on disk two, we have to update the parity information on disk three. So anytime you update information on any disk, it causes a write to disk three, which will cause disk three to die much, much quicker than all the other ones. Basically, it'll get like three times the writes. So it is a bit imbalanced, which is why this system isn't used. And also, it's a bit better than RAID 1. So if these were all, I don't know, two terabytes each, or, well, let's go bigger. Let's say these were all 10 terabyte hard drives each. Well, then the amount of usable space I have would be 30 terabytes. So I can use three disks essentially to store all my data. And then one of the disks is just reserved for storing all that XOR information. So I would have 40 terabytes worth of disk, but 10 of it, or a single disk is used for parity information, and all the rest have my data on it. Good? All right, so with parity, that's basically what that says. We can use like all of the space minus the amount of space for one disk, and we need at least three drives for this, otherwise it doesn't make sense. So for the pro, we get basically n times one performance. So basically we just argue about it more or less, it looks like RAID 0 with three disks without the parity disk. And the nice pro about it is unlike RAID 0, if a single disk dies, I don't lose any data. I get my ass to the store and buy another one and just have it recalculate it so I don't actually lose any data. But the big con here is that write performance suffers because essentially everything's concentrated on that parity disk, which is why it's no longer used. So it's only used to illustrate the next idea, which is RAID 5, which is exactly the same idea, but instead of having all the parity information on disk three, it'll just distribute it across all the disks. So essentially every disk will be responsible in this case for, hoard, for holding a fourth of the parity information. And the idea behind that is you, instead of concentrating all of the writes to a single disk, you kind of spread it out so it's more even and not concentrated on a single disk. Otherwise, exact, aside from just spreading out the parity information across the disk, 
we argue about it the same way we argue about RAID 4. Yeah? If we're using SSD, don't, doesn't it wear out by bytes to each section? In which case, wouldn't this also have the problem where the parodies would wear out a lot faster, like those specific sections in each drive? Yeah, so the parodies will wear out the drives faster, but if we put all the parity on a single SSD, that one SSD will dry, die way before the other ones, which some data centers actually like that for some reason. So some have gone back to that because they'd rather just one drive die quick and just replace it. So it, it's kind of come back. This is a much better idea if they were like spinning this. So kind of depends. Um, but mostly in terms of performance, you'd rather have it distributed out. And RAID 5, this is the first one other than RAID 0 and RAID 1 that's actually used. So this is what I was using to store my data when the unfortunate happened. So, RAID 5, oh, yep. Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna ask about high performance compared to RAID 1, but I guess you're good to that. Oh, yeah, so pretty much all the same things as RAID 4. So, a uh, high level, it's about the same, n times one, or n times one read performance, n times, or sorry, not times one, n minus one read and write performance, but the write performance, in the real world is slightly improved because that bottleneck of the single parity drive is now removed. We don't have to wait for every single operation to update that one disk. So in practice, it's a lot faster. Well, not a lot, but faster. All right, the next one that is used is RAID 6. And the idea behind RAID 6 is that it uses another parity uh, some other parity information. So instead of just having, you know, just P, that's an XOR of everything, it would have another bit of parity information, Q, which is a complicated thing that is not an XOR, that it is like a linear combination of XORs. Um, basically to explain whatever the hell Q is, I have to explain Galois fields and like some advanced mathematics and something like that. So don't worry about that. Someone else figured it out for you. <laughs> so just assume that Q is just another bit of parity information. So I have two bits of parity information. So now, same idea as RAID 6, or sorry, RAID 5. In this case where I have uh, five disks, I essentially have two disks used for parity but I'm going to distribute it across all the other disks, and otherwise it is the exact same. So I have two bits, I essentially have two disks used for parity, and then the other disks I can go ahead and the information's just striped across them. So with RAID 6, assuming these were all, I don't know, 10 terabyte drives, the size of two drives is used for parity, so of my 50 terabytes worth of drives, I could actually use 30 terabytes to store information. But the big pro with this is now I can withstand two drives dying. So as long as any two drives die, I can use these two bits of parity information to essentially reconstruct two bits of information instead of just one. So I can tolerate a single disk failure. So if I had this, if I had my thesis on this and two disks drives died, I would be okay. But I would have had to buy another drive in order to set this up. And I was a poor grad student, so yeah, I guess I just got what was coming to me. So yikes. So it can recover from two simultaneous drives failures. So do the extra parity, essentially I lose another disk of space, and this requires at least four drives. In practice, you probably want at least five. And write performance is going to be slightly less than RAID 5, just because I need a, every time I write a piece of data, I need to write two things of parity instead of just one. So in practice, it's going to be a bit slower than RAID 5, and I'm going to be able to use less of my space, but the main benefit I get here is that, well, I can tolerate two disk drives dying. So any questions about that? Okay, so there is a third one. If you read your textbook, your textbook, whoops, not that, your textbook is very strange. So 
RAID 1 is supposed to just be a mirror of everything and it's an exact copy. For some reason, your te textbook just says for RAID 0 or RAID 1. Whenever I say RAID 1, I actually mean RAID 10 or AKA RAID 1 plus 0. So why your textbook does this, I don't know, but there is a thing called RAID 10, which is basically RAID 1 plus 0. And the idea behind that is, let's say, I don't know, I have three disks. Disk 0, D1, D2. Not A. So say I have six disks. And five. Let's see what my drawing's like. Wow, they look like trash cans. All right, cool. Yeah, they look like that old Mac Pro or whatever that was the trash can edition. So the idea between RAID 1 plus 0 or RAID 10 is at the very top here, we use RAID 1. So we essentially split them in half and make both halves exactly like each other. So they're exact mirrors of each other. And then these two mirrors are split off into RAID zeros. So that means that this disk is exactly the same as this one. This one is exactly the same as this one. This one is exactly the same as this one. But between them, it's a stripe. So all of your data is striped across these disks. So, assuming each of these disks was, again, 10 terabytes, how much space can I use to actually hold my data? 30, right? I can use half of it. So, because they're exact copies of each other, it's like RAID 1, so I can use 30 on this side, 30 on this side, if they're 10 terabytes each. So in total, I can go ahead and I can only use 30 because, well, they're exact copies of each other. In terms of uh, read performance, my read performance, well, I could read a bit from all six of them at the same time, so I'd get six times. But in terms of write performance, well, I would get three times faster than six times faster, or sorry, two times faster, because I have to Two or three? Crap. Would it be two or three? Three. Three. Yeah, it would be three. Because, well, I'd get the speed up from here. So from writing to the RAID zero, I could write to all three of them in parallel. And I could do that in parallel with the other RAID zero. So I would get three times the write performance in this case. All right, what about the more important one? How many disks can fail until I lose data? Yeah. Whenever any like, matching pair fails, you fail? Yeah, whenever any matching pair fails, which in this case, well, if any one drive dies, that's okay. So let's say this disk died. Well, now I'm in the danger zone, but I might be okay. So essentially in this scenario, I will have data loss if disk three dies, right? Because then I have no more copies of that yellow data. But disk one, two, four, or five could die. So we can leave this up to the gods. So it might be the case I get lucky. In the worst case, right, as soon as I have one disk drive dies and this happens, I'm screwed. So I might only be able to tolerate one disk dying, but if I get lucky, well, maybe this disk dies. Okay, I still have a copy of the blue data. That's fine. Now, I'm really playing with fire if I don't replace anything, because if disk three dies, I'm screwed. If disk two dies, I'm screwed. But I might get lucky and say disk one dies. So best case, I can lose like a whole half of it. So I can lose half my drives if I have a nice lottery ticket. 
And I won't lose any data, but again, they typically, we typically only argue about the worst case. And in the worst case, well, I can only tolerate a single drive failure dying, but who knows, I might get lucky. So if I stored my thesis on this, I might have got lucky, but I would have needed six drives, so who knows. Um, also, like a practical thing, this will also be faster to rebuild. So the main reason why I didn't go out and buy a drive right away is because recalculating that parity information, depending on how big your drive is, and also writing to it can take like days or a, a day and a bit or days, yeah, sometimes days. Well, if you have this system, this is a lot faster because there's no parity involved at all. So if I went out to the store and I bought a new disk five, well, I just stick in disk five and then we just do a straightforward just data copy straight from disk two to disk five and it's much, 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 much faster because there's no parity information involved or anything like that. So in terms of pra practical reasons, some people like using this because it's a lot faster to actually repair when something inevitably goes wrong. But the big drawback here is that I can only essentially use half the space I have. And this is this. This is kind of what your Git repositories are on, something like this. So if the server dies, we have to be unlucky and a lot of drives have to die at once in order for you to lose all your work, but you don't really lose it because, well, it's Git and you have a copy of your repository on your computer, so it doesn't actually matter if my server blows up. Yay. All right, any other questions or anything? Yeah. Uh, read would be six times faster here because we could read just parts from all the disks. Yeah. Yep. So, I guess in practice, which system would you use for the one that's the data center versus the computer versus the other app? So, in practice, it just depends how much you care about the data, depends how much money you want to spend, depends how, yeah, what your tolerance to risk is how much space you need, factors like that. So there's no one size fits all solution. Um, in terms of data centers, they'll typically, they like really, really care about data. So, and they might have, you know, hundreds, thousands of disks that they all want to work together. So there are special like distributed file systems that will like keep three copies, like the most common thing is to keep three copies of the data and it distributes them among different computers so if a whole computer goes down, it's fine. Your data is still somewhere. That's basically what like, if you heard AWS S3, it's basically what they do. But it's like a distributed file system. So this is just on the same machine. So if you're Amazon or Google, um, you might have this on one machine, but then you'd also have multiple machines connected to each other. And then, you know, you distribute data that way. All right, any other? Fun questions, so yay hard drives. So disks enable persistence, we saw SSD, whoops, that's not that. So disks enable persistence, we have SSDs and RAIDs. SSDs are more like RAM, like except we go ahead and in top of accessing pages, there's also blocks that we have to erase and they have a few weird rules, most of the rules the operating system has to work with the hardware in order to get good performance. So it was especially a thing when SSDs was new to have operating systems that understood trim, AKA telling the disk drive whenever you're not using pages anymore. So it can go ahead and erase a block when it's otherwise not doing anything. And then we also use RAID so we can just get a bunch of disks in the same system together and tie them together in different ways so we can tolerate drive failures and improve performance while using multiple disks. So with that, just remember, pulling for you, we're all in this together. Do, do, do.